Okay, now next speaker, Loris Crow. Please welcome Loris Crow. He will uh, speak about uh, Zig. Zig. Zig makes Sigo cross compilation just work. Please welcome Loris. Thank you very much. Um, well, hello everyone. Yes, I'm Loris. Uh, this is some social media contacts. If you want to know more about me, uh, I work at the Z Software Foundation. I'm VP of Community. Um, but today I'm not here exactly to convince you to switch language. Uh, wrong conference, I guess, if that were the case. Um, but instead, I'm here to tell you actually how to get, in my opinion, a better experience out of Seago. And actually, if there's anybody here that um, is a Rust Lab refugee, like you decided to, to switch here for, just for this talk, um, I, this talk is going to be about Seago, but everything that I'm going to say about Seago will apply also one-to-one -to, -one to Rust, uh, in the case that your Rust code needs to also uh, depend on C or C++ code. Um, so let's start from the beginning. What even is Seago? So uh, uh, out of curiosity, uh, can you please raise your hand if you've ever compiled something with Seago enabled equals one? Few hands, not everybody. Okay, so uh, cool. So what is Seago? Um, Seago is a way for Go to depend on C or C++. Uh, well, I guess, let's start with C code. Uh, so give it a Go source file with um, specific lines in it. Um, you can have basically Go call C functions, roughly speaking. In practice, uh, a couple of like common use cases, uh, as an example, is Hugo. Uh, Hugo can be compiled normally, just Go, not no C Go. But if you want a, a more advanced CSS processing, pre-processing, uh, stuff. Uh, those are C libraries that Hugo depends on. So you need to uh, enable C Go. Um, you need to enable C Go if you want that, those functionalities. Uh, another, I think, common example would be if you want to use SQLite. Um, the, who here has used SQLite in a Go application? Raise your hands. A few more hands. Chances are then that if you raise your hand now but didn't before, you might have actually been using Seago and just didn't notice. Uh, it depends, there are different packages, but uh, if you're using mat n slash go dash sqli3, that one uses Seago. Um, that said, Seago is not all sunshine and rainbows. There's this blog post by Dave Cheney, uh, which I recommend you read. It's titled, Seago is not Go. And in this blog post, he explains uh, what it is that you give up if you want to use Seago. Because, uh, well, I, I kind of recap the blog post into these three bullet points. This is not a good general purpose recap of that blog post. This is a recap that makes sense for the purpose of this presentation. But his main point, which is very nuanced, and that's why I recommend you go read it, is that, um, if you want to use, if you want to depend on C libraries, you're pulling in a bunch of C complexity. Uh, and C is not as nice as Go uh, when it comes to certain things. So you need to be aware of this. Uh, uh, getting into the C ecosystem has a price. And so you need to make sure that, it, the, that what you gain is at least worth the extra pain that you're getting yourself into. But for some people, it is necessary. I believe there is a talk later uh, Tomorrow, maybe there's another talk uh, about a project that talks about uh, why they decided to use Seago um, uh, in their case. Uh, two more points that he makes, among many others, in the blog post is that he uh, says that if you use Seago, you lose Go's ability to do cross compilation because with Go, you just set your Goose variable, Go arch, uh, to whatever you want, and normally you are able to produce an executable for another machine. Uh, x86 to ARM, vice versa, Linux, Windows, Mac. Um, but if you depend on C code, that doesn't work anymore because Go knows how to cross-compile Go code. It doesn't know how to cross-compile C code. Uh, as a related problem, you also lose the ability to produce static binaries. Uh, Go uh, on platforms that support the feature 
uh, tries to always produce static binaries, and that's nice. It means that your um, you don't end up in a situation where you deploy an executable and it doesn't work because it's depending on some dynamic library that's missing on the system. There's people, I mean, I'm not saying that dynamic linking is necessarily bad, it's more nuanced than that, but there are certainly things to appreciate about static uh, linking. Yeah. I think we, is it back? Let me try to reconnect it. Okay, we're back. Uh, so, my point is, if you use Zig as your C, C++ compiler, because Zig is a programming language, but it's also a compiler that can compile C and C++, you still have to deal with C complexity. There's no silver bullet for that, unfortunately. Um, but at least you fix the remaining two points. So let me show you uh, exactly what I mean by that. So uh, let's close this, we don't need settings. You read this? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so um, I'm, on my, I'm on my Mac uh, and I have a uh, kind of a hello world example of a Seagull project. Uh, so you can see I have four files in here, a Go mod file, um, you probably know what's in there, nothing particularly interesting in our case. Then I have hello.go, hello.c, and hello.h. So uh, hello.go uh, has the uh, special C Go incantation, import C, as a comment above you can uh, add some C preprocessor directives uh, where you point out which header file you want to import. I'm not gonna go too much in the details of exactly how you interact with C code, you, that, that's a talk on its own. Um, so I'm just going to present roughly how the interoperation wor interoperability works. So inside main, we call c.hello, and hello is defined, well, let's look at what's inside the header file. So but hello .z, uh, hello h. Uh, this is just the other file. It contains just the definition and uh, it, it imports SDIO. And then hello.c contains the actual implementation of hello where you see it, it just prints. Very simple. It's just hello world, basically. Um, so with this, I can do cgo enabled uh, equals one, uh, go build. And you can immediately see that there's a bunch of warnings. That's my fault. I have uh, a very new Go, but not the latest Mac OS version. So the linker is complaining. Warnings, if, if, you, like, if you want to interoperate with C, get ready to uh, read warning lines. There's, they're always there. Um, I consider operating my Mac OS version this morning. Decided that, that wasn't the greatest idea. So warning lines, it is. Uh, but anyway, we do this, and we have hello, and yeah, it works, it prints. That's a C function that we've been calling from Go. Um, let's try to make a Linux version. So a Linux version would be the same, but I set my goose to uh, Linux. I try to do it, and you see that I don't just have warnings this time, I have errors. Uh, the build failed because, because if you have a C dependency, C needs at the very least uh, the C standard library, but it needs the C standard library for the other machine, not for your local machine. And that standard library, normally it's just not on your machine. There's a lot of things that you need to uh, fix and put together to be able to pull off cross compilation. But um, if we just had this, uh, if we override the C compiler that we're using, instead of using Clang, which is the one that you use by default on Mac, if you put there zigcc, and then we do also dash target uh, arch64, uh, 
Go calls ARM64 ARM64, but the, a name that other platforms use is ARM ARCH. I think it stands for ARM architecture. 64 uh, Linux. Then we go build. Uh, unsupported. Uh, a space where? Sorry. Oh, oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so this can be built. You didn't complain. Uh, if I do file, uh, hello. Now you can see that it's not a macho. It's not a macho file anymore. Now it's an elf file. Uh, so we built it correctly. It, we cannot run it on Mac, but uh, I don't know if you notice I'm sporting this fancy default terminal, uh, no personalization at all, and that's because I don't develop a Mac. I have a virtual machine, a Linux virtual machine. It's Nix OS. Uh, by the way, shout out to Mitchell Hashimoto, who made me aware of what I believe to be one of the best dev setups you can get today. Mac hardware, M1, Apple Silicon. Uh, but NixOS, it's, it's great. So if you're looking for, if you're shopping for a dev setup, uh, I recommend this one. I love it. Uh, anyway, uh, here we can access the host machine. So I can do slash uh, host slash Christoph slash hello. Uh, and, oh, upper KCD is so bad, okay. Uh, and here I can do, well, the slash hello, and it works. Uh, that's the executable that we just built. Um, another interesting thing, if you're not familiar with NixOS, uh, normally executables built outside of NixOS don't work in NixOS because dynamic linking in NixOS is special, uh, and you need to patch your executables that require a uh, dynamic loader. Uh, but in this case, it worked. Why? Uh, because if we do LD of uh, LDD, sorry, LDD of hello, uh, it's a statically linked executable. If you remember, there were three bullet points, right? C complexity, that one stays. Cross compilation, we did it. Um, static executables, we can get static executables. How does this work? Um, long story short. Glibc is a C standard library that requires dynamic linking, uh, but there's, an, there's other uh, C standard libraries. In particular, there's Muscle. Muscle is a C standard library uh, that works on Linux that allows you to do static linking. Uh, and so basically, Zig bundles not only Glibc, but also Muscle. Uh, and thanks to that, basically, you can have also static linking alongside cross compilation out of the box. Now, I showed you the easy example. We can also do the inverse. We can go from Linux and try to produce an executable for Mac. When it comes to Go, to C Go, like the building the Go runtime, because this is a Go application, right? So it has the Go runtime in it. It's, it just does, uh, it just prints, but it, it's a full-fledged Go application. Uh, and Go on Mac has a dependency on a Mac OS framework. Uh, it's something to do with SSL certificates, makes sense. Uh, so basically, in that case, cross compilation is a little bit more complicated because you have to copy over those frameworks, which is, it's like Mac libraries, basically. You have to copy them over on your machine, and they cannot be distributed directly by Zig because of licensing. So you have to do that manually, but it can be done. Um, I'm, not doing, I'm not demoing it now, but I'll show you a link later that actually goes through this process just so that you can see, you know, not only the happiest path, you can see also, um, cases where you have to, to work more. Okay, so what is Zig? What, why are we using the compiler of another language to, to compile C? Uh, why are we not just using a C compiler? Um, so let me give you a bit of information about Zig. Zig is a general purpose programming language and tool chain, and tool chain being the part that you probably care about more right now, uh, for, maintaining, for maintaining robust, optimal, and reusable software. Uh, Zig is a low-level language, and it has very direct interoperability with C. So since we care about interoperability with C, it's a lower-level language, you know, with minor memory management and all that cool stuff. 
Um, and also we are using LLVM to produce release builds. It doesn't take much to also bundle alongside LLVM Clang. So we basically bundle both LLVM, we bundle Clang, and we expose, basically when you're using ZigCC as the core compiler, you're using Clang. So you're not using like a completely unproven compiler with no optimizations or whatnot, it, it's Clang. The reason, but, but it's not just a rebranded Clang. Um, there is a bunch of stuff done on top of it. Case in point, we try to, we were implicitly using Clang earlier on macOS and cross completion was just immediately failing. Um, because Zig does a lot of, builds a lot of things on top of Clang to support cross compilation and a few other things. Um, just to give you a general idea of the design of Zig and the project, Zig is a simple language. Uh, we don't have hidden control flow. There are no hidden memory allocations, no preprocessors, no macros. In general, we care about simplicity. I think that's a uh, appreciation that we share, uh, both Go and Zig share. So you might be interested in that. Um, Zig doesn't have macros, but it does have metaprogramming, and it has this thing called comtime, which is kind of like uh, C++ or Rust constexper stuff, except on steroids. Uh, and uh, actually, you, you know how in Go you have metaprogramming, runtime metaprogramming, right? You can do reflection. Uh, in Zig, there is no runtime type information, so you cannot do runtime metaprogramming. It, it, like a Zig executable, it's kind of like a C executable, so it types evaporate. Um, but what you cannot do at runtime, you can do at compile time. So we have the ability to run arbitrary code, like call functions, at compile time. And when you're doing metaprogramming, like generics, for example, we don't have special syntax for generics. Uh, at compile time, you can pass around types as normal values, and do reflection on them. So long story short, the generics in Zig and, and compile time metaprogramming more in general kind of looks like runtime metaprogramming in Go to a certain degree, to, to give you a big idea. Um, and that's usually the thing that people uh, uh, appreciate the most when they first approach Zig. More directly related to our talk today, uh, we have this idea, we, we call it maintaining with Zig, well, the idea is that if you have an existing code base, an existing C and C++ code base, there, there are situations where you, like, you, you can't escape uh, easily from 500,000 lines of C or C++ code. Like it's, it's it, you know, scenes of generations before you maybe that <laughs> require time to fix. So the idea is that uh, in Zig, there's this very, a uh, gradual approach where you gain something on every step of the way instead of having ideally, hopefully, a big payoff once you get rid of the old thing completely. So the idea is that you can start by simply using Zig CC or and Zig C++, that's the other command, um, to compile your, like to replace basically uh, Clang or your, your existing C compiler. And what's nice is that Zig is zero dependency. Um, and uh, we'll see later, I can also help you produce hermetic builds. Um, so from that, you gain also the ability to cross, do cross compilation in case you care about that. Then the next point is that C and C++ projects tend to have uh, messy, they tend to have a mess when it comes to build systems because uh, somebody wants to use make, then somebody else adds CMake, then somebody is on Windows and make doesn't work, so can I have a batch file? Um, then, oh, oh no, it went back and I disconnected it by mistake. So um, you have a batch file and maybe somebody else is saying, oh, but I'm using PowerShell, can I have a PS1 file as well? So auto tools, it, usually building C++ projects, it's non-trivial. Uh, Zig has its own build system that can build C and C++ projects, it's called Zig Build. So you have Zig, you use Zig to uh, to run the, the build process. Uh, and so you can get rid of, a, of yet another dependency. And then after that, if you want, since Zig can interoperate very directly with C and C++, you can just add a Zig compilation unit to your overall compilation process. Uh, and you can gradually, one compilation at a time, move forward your project, uh, if you want. Or if you don't want, I think even just getting rid of CMake is probably not a bad idea, in my opinion. Um, 
so, okay, uh, is anybody actually taking this stuff seriously? Uh, well, I think for me, the most interesting uh, example of somebody using Zig with Sego is myself. <laughs> the Zig website is a Hugo project. It's actually a hacky fork of Hugo uh, that I made, where basically I integrated a, uh, a Zig program, a Zig library that um, is able to check our code samples so that when something changes in the language, Zig is not yet a, a stable as a language. It's a lot more stable as a tool chain, uh, Zig CC especially but the language is still in flux, and so occasionally there's a change in the language, uh, or maybe the standard library, a code sample breaks, and our tool basically uh, fails the Hugo build, which is nice. And I developed that on, well, this Mac, which is ARM, but I had to deploy it on x86, and so I built Hugo, um, I cross-compiled Hugo on my machine, and that's nice. Uh, another example is this website, for an event that I'm making. This, this is another very neat Go application. I'm using Echo, um, uh, the Stripe APIs to handle uh, purchases of tickets, and I'm saving everything inside an SQLite database. SQLite pulls in Sego, uh, and uh, I know that there's also, there was an article a while ago about uh, the trade-offs between using the original SQLite uh, C code versus a version that was machine translated to Go, but the version machine translated to Go was slower, so you know what? Well, like, uh, if I use Zig, I don't really have a big downside. I just have to add a couple extra lines when compiling it. Uh, so it's, it's nice. I'm very happy with this application. It's like just a single executable. Uh, the HTTP server is exposed directly. It handles automatically. Uh, let's encrypt renewal. I, I love this experience, so um, that, was, that was awesome. And um, and yeah, and cross compilation was uh, also key to be able to deploy this. Uh, yeah, the, uh, I guess third place in my personal list of preferences, uh, there's also these people, Uber, that's a company, they do stuff with cars. Uh, but apparently they also have a huge Go monorepo, like they have a lot of projects, uh, Go projects, and some of those depend on C code, so they are C Go projects, and they are using Zig to make hermetic builds, because for them, I guess, this type of stuff uh, really matters. Uh, and it's in, they have executables in production built with Zig. They are trying to move all, uh, all these builds uh, using uh, Zig. They also maintain uh, the, the guy in the, in the preview, uh, he is Matthias, and he is the author of Bazel ZigCC. If anybody here has used Bazel, uh, he, he's the creator of it. Well, not of all Bazel, sorry, of Bazel ZigCC specifically, which is the integration between Bazel and ZigCC. Um, in the future, we, right now Zig doesn't have a package manager, but we would like the Zig package manager to also be a package manager for C and C++. So the idea is that if you can take a C project and have a build system that just, it's just, you run Zig build and it builds, no matter the platform that you're on, all the time, no need to do weird things. Uh, that also can be, can help improve your experience uh, with Sego, right? Because in the case that you want to pull in, a, you're not just writing a bit of code yourself, but like you're pulling in a big, complicated C dependency, it's easier if you can build that library with just a one command instead of having to uh, also, somehow, who came into SimAco or whatnot. Uh, and this is an example of Mitchell Hashimoto. Uh, he made zig-lib.xml2. And what's nice about this package is that there's, uh, it's not a zig uh, interface to the package. It just uses the zig build system to build the C project. It's basically doing what I just described, uh, simplifying just the build process. Uh, and it would be nice to be able to then distribute this stuff with the Zig package manager, and this is probably something that you, you might appreciate as well from the Seagull perspective. Uh, so, okay, let's say that I convinced you and you want to try your hand at using Zig to cross-compile. So you can go to zigang.org, you can download, uh, you need to download the compiler, of course. Try, see how it goes. Um, things might go wrong. Uh, it's complicated in C++. It, it, simple, trivial projects are always simple and trivial to build, but there's stuff out there that's 
a lot more complicated. So my recommendation is to join AZ community and ask for help there. They will be able to tell you if it's you who's missing something or if it's maybe us who, uh, who are doing something wrong. It, occasionally it happens that we discover new things that we just don't support. Uh, we had an interesting experience learning how Go uh, builds its own runtime when you're doing Seago. It's a very unorthodox, and, uh, and it was an interesting experience. There, there's, long story short, there, there's a lot of weird stuff happening out there. Um, so we are definitely uh, interested in learning things that don't work so we can fix them. Um, some recommended uh, reading, some recommended links. So there's also QR codes if you want to just quickly um, take a picture of that. I guess the, the most simple starting point is this blog post, Zig makes Docker simulation just work. The, the title is eerily similar to this talk. As you can imagine, this is basically a blog post version equivalent of this talk, roughly speaking. And in there you can find a few, you can find like the command lines so that you can copy paste them um, more easily. Also, in there, there are instructions in case you are using a version of Go, which is 1.17 or lower. Uh, there was a change that, uh, basically, before 1.18, uh, you cannot just immediately straight up put zigcc in the, in the cc variable uh, in, on the command line invocation. Uh, this explains you what's wrong and, and how to work around that bug for older versions of Go. Uh, second recommended reading is uh, this blog post by Andrew Kelly, the original creator of Zig. Uh, this goes more into detail on exactly what it is that Zig is doing that might maybe convince you that it's not that bad of an idea to use Zig as a C or C++ compiler. Uh, and finally, uh, there's a blog post about this maintain it with Zig idea. Uh, this blog post is more about the philosophy and uh, with how we approach uh, our, our philosophy in how we want the Zeek ecosystem to cooperate uh, with the C and C++ ecosystem. Also, linked inside this article, there's like a, another blog post series, uh, more, which is more hands-on, where basically we take Redis and put Redis through this uh, maintaining with Zeek idea. So we start building it with ZeekCC, we start trying to cross-compile it, but keeping the original make files. Uh, then we get bored of battling in the make files, so we replace them with the zig build. And then finally, we add a new Redis command uh, implemented in zig, because you can just add it and then compile everything together and it, and it works. Um, so you can use that also as an example in case um, you want to see uh, more in detail what it means to put your hands on the C side of things more than, I guess, the Go side of things. Um, let's see, do we have time for a second demo? I think we do. Yes, we totally do. Okay, so the useful part of the talk is over. The next part is gonna be hopefully somewhat interesting and entertaining. I'm going to show you just to uh, you know, it might be uh, pick your curiosity. What I'm showing you, this is not something you should attempt. I do not recommend you do any of these in production at all. We're going to change the Go compiler and recompile it. So, um, let's, I'm switching to Linux because I'm actually doing some actual development now. So I have a checkout of, um, of the, Go project, and uh, inside the source directory, uh, so um, I, when trying to fix some bugs specific between the, uh, specific to how C Go uses, uh, expects to use the, to be able to use the C compiler, uh, I got vaguely a little bit familiar with the Go compiler, at least, you know, the, the, the parts relative to C Go, uh, and I learned that uh, there's two places, it used to be one, more recently it became two places, where um, Go is basically scanning the folder, the project folder with uh, all the files, and it's looking for, uh, for C files to then pass to the C compiler. 
uh, we're going to hack that a little bit. So I know that the line looks like this. There's case uh, dot C. It's matching the, the extension, the dot C extension. Uh, this is a regex, so we're going to skip the dot. And yes, these are our two matches. Two files, they do this. So I'm going to hack them a little bit. Uh, I'm going to also do this. If you happen to see a zip file, hand that over to the C compiler as well. Uh, let me find the other file and I'll apply the same change. Okay. Uh, so let's see. Just double check everything. That's that's it. Um, so we can now build uh, everything. Uh, we just call make, I believe. Oh yeah, right. And I need a C compiler uh, to build everything. So uh, this is why I love Nix. Nix shell dash p gcc. Uh, <laughs> okay, we're building Go with the change that I just made. Two lines. It takes a moment. Bootstrapping Go, it's not immediate. It doesn't take too long, though. I'm sure there's much worse bootstrap chains out there. <laughs> much worse. <laughs> um, Uh, bootstrapping means going from a um, from a C compiler to your language compiler. So it takes it basically builds a it it, it depends it, cha it can change from project to project. But as a general point, bootstrapping is the process of I have a C compiler that I trust. I have some source code that I can inspect. I want to reach the working compiler, uh, like the final version of your of the of the target language whose compiler I'm building. And basically, I go through the entire chain because I don't trust any intermediate executable. Uh, there's a paper that you can read called Trust in Trust uh, that explains why you might be interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, if you want to deploy a language, I think, on a distro, like if you want package managers to be able to offer your compiler as a, as a package on their distro, they will want to be able to bootstrap your stuff. Uh, they will not want you to, you know, hand over a binary blob and say, yeah, you can trust this. They, they, they want to do everything themselves. And the, the starting point tends to be most of the time a C compiler because a C compiler it's easy to port to new architectures. Okay, so we have a new Go. Uh, well, to be precise, we have two Go's. We have the system Go, Go uh, version. And we have uh, these local Go. Uh, uh, no, it's outside, slash bean, slash go. Uh, okay, we want to use this other version. We don't want to use the system go compiler. Uh, okay, so let me do this also. I'm going to go back to my home and I'm going to copy over, uh, actually I can exit this Nix shell. So th this was just a temporary environment where, where I was uh, able to use GCC. Uh, back to my normal prompt. And we uh, copy dash r uh, host uh, Christoph hello and we copied it here. Okay. Uh, let's see, three, what's in there? Uh, let's remove the, file, the hello file. Uh, that, the, what, the file that I just deleted was the compile executed all that we compiled earlier. Uh, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to move hello.c to hello.z. Uh, and let's make it become a zig file. Uh, zig doesn't look like the syntax is not the same as C, so we actually have to, to change it. So const std is import. 
So we import this in the library. Uh, then we do export. We are creating a function that we want to make available uh, as a symbol when we are doing linking afterwards. Export uh, hello. And in here we do std debug the print. Hello from Zig. Okay, uh, this looks fine. Uh, let's try to build it and see if it works. Uh, so, sego enable equals one. Uh, we want cc to be zig cc, and we want to use our go, uh, the one that we just built. So that's from it's from my home directory slash go dash source. Uh, I think it's bin slash go. Perfect build, and now we'll see if I mess something up with my demo. I think I did not. Two lines of code, direct integration with Zig. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It, it's a bit of an, it's, I guess it's funny to show that you can just add two lines and, and it works. The way this works, the, the reason why this works is because Go is simply finding C files, handing them over to the C compiler, and it just so happens that ZigCC, understandably, can also understand Zig files on top of, of C files. Uh, I don't think I will try to make a pull request to the Go project so that they add support for this. I don't think they would accept if I did, uh, but it's nice to it's nice to show that um, you know if, if you don't make things overly complicated and you have reasonably simple abstractions, then you can do this type of thing because it Go is not doing anything that doesn't make any sense. Um, and with this, I think that's it. That's the end of my talk. If someone has any question, please raise your hand and I will come to you with the mic. Yeah. So, during the talk, you said several times about integration with C slash C++, as if they were the same thing or almost the same thing. Can you tell a little bit more about the complexity about in, uh, calling C++ from, uh, let's say from Go, because that's uh, my, my main interest, but also from, from Zig, if you, if you have time to answer, because of all the implementation details of C++, which is classes, name mangling, and, and, and things like that. I mean, maybe not a complete answer, but the, at least a pointer where to start. Yeah. Um, to keep it simple, don't, you can't. C++ is a nightmare. There is no C++ ABI. If you try to use two different C++ compilers, there will be no ABI compatibility. I think it, if you use two different versions of the same C++ compiler, compiler there will be no ABI compatibility. Um, <laughs> uh, and so the point, I think, uh, let's say from the Zig perspective as, the tool, as a tool chain, not as a language, uh, Zig can compile C++ code. So if you have C++ code, all your C++ code compiling needs, as long as they, that C++ code can be compiled with Clang, so if you have like, uh, I don't know, MSVC specific stuff, uh, MSVC is the Microsoft C compiler, C++ compiler, uh, then yeah, that's gonna be a problem, but if your stuff builds with Clang, it's gonna build with Zig, and you can, you can do it. You will need to write C wrappers around your C++ API uh, that you're going to use. It's unfortunate. Uh, I think th there are some projects that are trying to tackle direct interoperability with C++. It's tough. They are trying to solve a extremely hairy problem. Uh, I, I would say going back to the previous talk from uh, Roberto, 
C++ is the kind of language where it's really hard to become an expert, even as a compiler designer. So I try to keep C++ dependencies to a minimum, in all honesty. But if you have to, see wrapper around it. It's not nice, but it works. And uh, all that I just said applies to both CGO, uh, as far as I am aware, and also C, uh, and also Zig. So Zig can interoperate directly with C, but not with C++. You need to have a C ABI interface between them. Any other question? You talked about um, uh, using Clang compiler uh, as the basis for uh, Zig build system. Why not uh, GCC? Can you choose between uh, Clang and GCC? Or if not, uh, how come you decide to use uh, Clang instead of GCC? Sure. So the question is, why Clang and why not GCC? Uh, the answer is that um, Zig is a 40 megabyte uh, archive when you download it from the website. Inside those 40 megabytes, you get the compiler, and you also get uh, a bunch of C libraries, uh, C standard libraries. So as I mentioned earlier, GLibC, a bunch of different versions, and maybe not strictly all of them, but like all the reasonably modern ones, even relatively old. So you can target a specific GLibC version, because for some people that actually makes a difference, uh, unfortunately for them, uh, and everybody else, I guess, as well. Um, but th there are plenty of tricks to basically that we make to deduplicate information and try to compress everything as much as we can. Now, of those 40 megabytes, e a big binary dependency in there is our dependency on LLVM. We use LLVM to make release builds of Zig executables. So once, since we are depending on LLVM, uh, we basically chose to also add the Clang source stuff. Uh, and so we have basically, when you call Zig CC, there's a brief moment where we parse the argument line because we, the arguments, because we support a superset. For example, we can handle .zig files. Clang can't handle .zig files. But once you pass these, let's say, translation layer, then at some point we just translate the commands and call directly into the main function of Clang. Uh, so long story short, we don't have, we have Clang because we already depend on LLVM. We don't have anything related to GCC. As far as I know, we don't have plans to uh, support that as well. It's going to be, in our case, uh, always Clang for practical reasons. I th also, the Z compiler is just, I think, a few megabytes, I think, without LLVM. So that's interesting. We have our own mechanical generating mechanics. They just don't do release builds. Any other question? Seems that we're good. Um, if there are no other questions, um, well, it's the end of the talk. Um, yeah, There's going to be the, the next one, it's going to start. At 12:30, so it's gonna, there are 15 minutes. Um, go grab a coffee, uh, have a pause. Yeah. I don't know. And, um, I'm also happy yeah. if you have like specific questions about a specific project, specific gnarly C, C++ stuff. I try to learn as little as I can, especially about C++. But if I had to face some of those things, I'll be happy to share my pain with you. Uh, yeah, let's go grab a coffee. <laughs>